Pepper Shop presents a little history of of religion. Chapter nine: The Ten Commandments. The children of Israel had escaped from bondage in Egypt, but their troubles were just beginning. The drowning of the Egyptian army in the Sea of Reeds had given them courage, and Moses had persuaded them to follow him into the desert. And yeah, the general view at the time was that gods, like football teams today, were tenny penny. You obviously supported the home god, but it doesn't mean you despise all the others, like a football game. And so, yeah, you'd obviously, if you're an Israelite, you support the Israelites, and if you support the Egyptians, if you're an Egyptian, then you support the Egyptians. And of course, it's like a football game; you have to fight. <laughs> But then, yeah, all of this has to do something too, and then there's more to it. It didn't take them long to find out that Moses didn't see things that way. But to them, that didn't mean that there were no other gods in the league. It meant that there was the best, and it was theirs. It didn't take them long to find out that Moses didn't see it that way. He had told them that he was leading them to a land flowing with milk and honey. But he seemed in no hurry to get there. Ages after they left Egypt, they came to the foot of a mountain. Wait here," he said. "While I go to the top to get the next set of directions for the voice of God." He was away so long that the Israelites got bored and restless. They got the craftsmen among them to make a giant bull, a golden bull calf, one of the symbols for God in the religion of Egypt. They raised it up on a platform and called the Israelites to worship it. Maybe they were already feeling homesick for, for Egypt, or maybe they just needed a break after their long trip through the desert. The worship of the golden calf became, well, a rave. Their drum beat, and the Israelites danced exact excitedly round the image. They lifted their heads up as ecstatic, at fans at a rock concert. Suddenly, Moses was back in their midst, and he was furious. He stopped the revelry and called for silence. The voice that spoke to him on the mountain sent him back with the list of ten commandments, and Israelites were to follow, starting now. He said all of this and happened. To get hold of the issue, well, what surprised the Israelites was that the second commandment forbade them making pictures. Not just the garb, but of anything. No image, no word. That baffled them. It was as natural as breathing for humans to paint the animals they hunted or the gods they worshipped, or as any child paint the animals they hunted or the gods they worshipped was a bit of a piece of chalk could prove. The voice that spoke to Moses was deeply suspicious of any kind of art, but was absolutely furious with humans trying to use it to capture the mystery of its own being. So, what was behind God's fury? To get hold of the issue, it will help if we go back to our discussion of symbols. We notice how they connected people to bigger realities, and are among humans' most useful inventions. A shorthand way writing was invented that became even more useful. You could no longer translate anything into words in a book; you could hold in your hands. Then no, the mistake was to confuse the words with what they stood for and treat them as if they were the same. Things are never what we say they are. You can't drink the word water; it's the sign for water, not water itself. Troubles that believers often treat religious words as if that rule didn't apply to them. It was as if their God, their word for God, were God. Their book were the ink marks on paper, but God Himself compressed between the covers. No wonder they often ended up fighting with each other who had the best words and the best symbols for God. None of them comes close. Under the God of the Second Commandment, no human art of any sort, whether in the form of pictures on a wall or words in a book, gets anywhere near conveying the mystery of God. The Second Commandment was the most important insight into the God ever discovered by humans. The real target was religion, and not just ever discovered by humans. Its real target was religion, and not just the way it got people dancing round a golden calf. It was warning us that no religious system could capture or contain the mystery of God. Neither religious systems could capture or contain. That's exactly what what many of them would go on to claim. The second commandment was an early warning that the organizations that claimed to speak for God would become God's greatest rivals, the most dangerous idols of all. But it would take them to Israelites a long time to get that message. Invisible ink time. And by now, after Moses died on that the same mountain, the Israelites decided they needed a king to lead them in this incessant warfare. The other tribes had kings, so why couldn't they? Their first king was a guy named Saul. Yeah. After that, well, he spent most of his reign fighting to secure Israel's place in Canaan. One of the tribes they came up with was called the Philistines.
and after his after Ab after Moses his dinner after Moses died his general Joshua came up to become king. So the Philistines had their fair soldiers and had a giant called Goliath. One day when the two armies were lined up against each other, Goliath stepped forward to challenge anyone from Saul's army to single combat. No one volunteered from Israel's side till a young shepherd boy stepped toward to accept the challenge. The young shepherd boy used his sling and threw the rock that he placed in it onto Goliath's head. And that slammed into him, and he fell down. Yay! This mighty boy became the next king of Israel! What was his name? We all probably know what it is. And he became the next king after Joshua died. <sighs> Alright, so when Saul died in the battle, David succeeded him. He became the king Israel would look back as their ideal. He reigned for 30 years, much of it spent in battle. It was his son Solomon who built Israel's first temple. <sighs> Where the people offered the gods their finest beasts and sacrifice and crops of their field. And they smothered him, being flattered and incensed. They had become a long way from the days of bondage in Egypt. They were no longer a lost alliance of wandering tribes. Now they were a proper nation. They had their own king. They had a fine temple. And they finally did it. Except their god didn't think so. The god didn't think so. And there has been a lot of things that happened for them. The god right there did not think so. That everything was like this. And he hated what the Israelites had turned him into. And he wanted them to go back to the simplicity of their own lives. And have whatever they had in the places of their things. He wanted widows cared for, not cheated out of their possessions. And there has been a lot of things that have happened for us. It took another generation of slavery that in a foreign land for the Israelites, finally to understand what God had been trying to tell them all along. As an independent kingdom, they had never been very secure anyway. Even after they won their battles against the local tribes and had the land of Canaan as their own, they had been in constant danger. The promised land was the corridor between mighty powers to the north and the south. Egypt in the south this was the Assyrian Empire to the north of Mesopotamia that had the biggest impact on their freedom. In hundreds of years, after they had been liberated from Egypt, the Israelites were again in bondage. They were overrun by Assyria and suppressed as a kingdom. More, they were overrun by the... 10,000 of them were deported and sent into exile in Babylon. And just as the idea of God had been changed by the tribes in Canaan, so was they changed by their sufferings in Babylon. At first they thought they had lost their God forever. <coughs> he was in their temple that Solomon had built for them back in Jerusalem. They wept by the waters of Babylon when they remembered it. How could they sing the Lord's song in the strange land? But their grief brought them a new understanding of God. God was not an idol stuck in temple. He wasn't even a stuck in Canaan. God was everywhere. God was with them in Babylon as he had been with Jerusalem and in Egypt. In fact, God had been with them at all those times and in all those places, as the prophets had said. They could see it all now. If only they had understood what the prophets had told them. But they would make it up for them now. They began to collect the stories that had come down to them about God's actions in their past. Stories about the voices that had spoken to Abraham. Stories about how they had been called into covenant or marriage with the one true God who would be with them always. Whether in bondage or in freedom, whether in their own land with its beloved rivers and hills, or in this land whose rivers to them in their exile in Babylon as they wonder about the meaning of their own history, God began speaking to them again. Through the prophets he sent, and this time, they listened. See you guys in the next episode, Prophets.